If you want to go ahead and find your, your seat again, we'll get started. You know, I got uh, both a, a text um, and, an, and an email this morning from, uh, I, love, I love just the, the energy. We want to connect and greet each other. Um, that's awesome. Uh, if you didn't know, today is, is Super Bowl Sunday, and um, I got a text and an email from folks in our church who said, you know, we really ought to be as excited about coming to church as we are about the Super Bowl, and so maybe at the end of your sermon, we could just dump some Gatorade uh, on you as a way to celebrate. So if I look warily over my shoulder at different points in the sermon, that will be why, but uh, it's good to... Uh, Get to see all of you this morning. Good to be back with you. If you were here last Sunday, uh, John Turner did an excellent job of kicking off our new teaching series. It's called The Questions That Jesus Asks. And if any of you uh, grew up in the church, you were a, a child who attended children's Sunday school classes. By the way, praise God. Thank you for those of you who serve uh, with our kids, even those who are serving right now to uh, care for and teach our children. But if you grew up in church, in Sunday school, it probably didn't take long for you to learn that the answer to the teacher's question is most often Jesus. Even if you don't know the answer, you can guess uh, the answer is Jesus. Uh, but have you ever considered how often Jesus is actually the one asking the question? More than any other person, all throughout the Bible, Jesus asks questions. More than 300 of his questions are recorded for us in the four gospel accounts of Jesus' life. We're not going to look at all 300 of those questions. We'll focus in on 10 of them together. But Jesus is constantly asking questions. And part of the reason we want to look at these questions, one reason is because we want to learn from Jesus' example. Uh, often Jesus asks questions as a way to teach, but sometimes it's as a way to help people see themselves or God or life from a new perspective. But nearly every time Jesus asks a question, he asks because he desires genuine relationship with the person on the other end of that question. He asks good questions, he listens, has a way to engage in relationship with others, and we therefore throughout this series uh, want to learn from his example. We wanna be inspired, we want to get better at asking good questions, of learning to, to love people, to serve people by asking thoughtful questions and listening uh, to their answers. So that's part of the reason we're in this series. The, the other reason we're looking at these questions that Jesus asks is because we believe that the very questions that Jesus asked people 2,000 years ago through the Holy Spirit as they're recorded for us in Scripture are questions that he continues to ask, that he asks of you and me today. And you know, a good question is a lot like a key. Some of you might know that a couple of weeks ago, our church closed on the purchase of this church property, and one of the things that's been pretty overwhelming is just how many keys uh, there are to this building, to various doors and cabinets. Some of them are well-labeled, others of them are not, but can I tell you how satisfying it is when you find that right key that turns the lock and opens the door or the cabinet? And you know, good questions are like keys. They're, they're able to unlock parts of our hearts that otherwise might be guarded, that might be locked, that might otherwise be shut. And I think that these questions that Jesus asks, they, they have this way of, of unlocking those guarded parts of our hearts. And one of our hopes then through this series as we engage with these questions is that we would find that our hearts are opened up. They're unlocked to Jesus in new and deeper ways. And you know, of all the questions that Jesus asks, uh, maybe the question that he asks that we're going to look at together this morning might be the most important question of all. 
The question that he poses to his disciples in Matthew 16, we'll come to it in a moment. Jesus says, what about you? Who do you say that I am? In many ways, that question is the question behind so many of the other questions that we're going to look at together in this series. For instance, when Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? He's saying, do you believe that I'm the person who's actually able to meet the deepest longings of your heart? Or when Jesus says, why are you so afraid? He's saying, do you believe that I'm actually the one who is able to rule over every part of your life for your good? When Jesus says, does no one condemn you? Where are your accusers? He's saying, do you believe that I'm the one who's able to forgive your sins and to free you from shame? In many ways, this question, who do you say I am? The question of Jesus' identity is actually the question behind so many of the other questions that we'll consider throughout this series. And as we believe that the identity of this Jewish rabbi from Nazareth who lived 2,000 years ago, that his identity is actually the key to unlock the meaning of life. It's the key by which you make sense of this world, who you are, your purpose in life is found by being able to answer this question of Jesus' identity, who do you say I am? It's the first question, it's the most important question, but as we're going to see in this story, there are actually two other questions that then flow from this first question. Two other doors, if you will, that are unlocked by this question. This question leads naturally to a second question of who do you say I am? Secondly, what do you think I've come to do? What do you think I've come to do? What are your expectations for what I'm going to do in your life? And then thirdly, how can you find yourself? How can you find your true self? These other two questions naturally flow out of this first and most important question. So we're going to walk through these three together this morning. And so we'll start in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, beginning in verse 13. And instead of reading the whole passage and then preaching, I'm going to read through the passage this morning as we go. So you'll see it up on the screen. Beginning in verse 13, here's what we're told. But when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And that was Jesus' favorite reference to himself. In other words, who do people say I am? That's a little bit of an easier question to answer. You're speaking on behalf of what do, what do other people think? What are you hearing? What are the crowds saying? And so the disciples answer. They say, well, some people say you're John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But then Jesus makes it more personal. He directs the question to them. He directs the question to us. He says, but what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? And it's almost as if Jesus, who has been with these disciples now for at least a year, He's been happy for them to spend this time together with him, to notice and observe his character, to see the the miracles that he has performed. He's, he's, He's been happy for them to just kind of be with Jesus, around Jesus in this moment, though, He's he's pushing them to this place of saying, you can no longer be passive observers. You can no longer just be around me. He's he's pushing them to this place where they, they have to make a decision about who he is. They have to be willing to, to cross a threshold, if you will, in their determination of, of who do they believe this Jesus really to be? Who do you say I am? You know, I was meeting with somebody this week, as I love to, to do. Somebody, he and his wife have been, been visiting our church recently, and I got to hear some of his story of how he came to faith, and then, then he asked me, he said, what about for you? When did the penny drop for you? When did you feel like you really were clear about who this Jesus is? And 
I, I told him, I said, you know, I think there have been several kind of key sort of faith um, moments and decisions in my life, but, but, but I think back especially uh, to my freshman year of college. Um, because that was a time where there were some challenging things happening in our, our family and, and for me personally. And I was really wrestling with this idea of, of Jesus' grace. What does it mean for, for God to love me, to forgive me, to accept me? Not because of what I do, but because of what Jesus has done for me. That felt like a new idea, a new concept to me. And it was really meaningful to me personally at the same time, though, that I was really struggling intellectually. My professors were asking tough questions about the Bible. Can the Bible really be trusted? Is, is this Christian faith that I've grown up with, is it all a myth? Can any of it really be believed? And even if I wouldn't have necessarily told people if I were in a Christian setting, I was really struggling with these doubts, these questions of, is any of this true at all? Is it worth believing? And I remember one night, I was walking home to my dorm, and I was, I was listening to music. I think it was like an iPod shuffle. Anybody remember those? And, and I didn't have like a playlist. It was just the random, you know, whatever song comes on. And so a, a worship song came on. It was a song um, by Hillsong. It was a song called Mighty to Save. And so here's how that song begins. It says, everybody needs compassion. The kindness of a savior, let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, a love that's never failing. And I remember hearing that and thinking to myself, yeah, I, I, I know that I need to be forgiven. I, I, I want this love that's never failing. Wouldn't this all be wonderful if it were true, if there really were a God who accepted and loved us based on his grace like that? But is any of it even true? Can it even be believed? And then, and then the next verse in that song says, Savior, he can move the mountains. Our God is mighty to save and then it says, Jesus conquered the grave. He rose and conquered the grave. And I remember hearing that and thinking to myself, I've been reading a lot about arguments for, for why to believe in the resurrection. Did the resurrection really happen as a fact of history? And in that moment, as I heard those words, I remember thinking to myself, you know what? I'm convinced. I really do think Jesus rose from the dead. And then the next verse it goes like this. It says, so take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow. Everything I believe in, I surrender. And I found myself singing out loud as I was walking home in that moment. It was just like this, this feeling, this sense that, 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 that I'd crossed some kind of threshold, that I'd made a decision, that I'd decided, you know what? I think this is true. Jesus, I really do want to follow you. I really do want to give my life to surrender to you. I still had questions. I still had doubts. I still had sin struggles. I still had a, a lot of junk in my life, and yet there was the sense that I was crossing that threshold. Who do you say I am? I believe you're my savior. You're the one who can meet my deepest needs. And listen, I don't presume that everybody in this room this morning has crossed that threshold. That you would say, I'm convinced that Jesus is who he says that he is. Maybe you're here this morning and you'd say, I don't know if I'm a Christian. And, and I want to just say, we're so glad you're here. When we started this church, we said we want to be a church for the convinced and for the unconvinced. That this should be a safe place where you can ask questions, you can express doubts, you can say, I don't know that I'm a believer yet, and that's great, that's okay. But can I also say, I believe there comes a moment in the life of every person who is genuinely exploring Jesus and saying, who is Jesus really? I believe there comes a moment where Jesus addresses this question to you personally. But what about you? Who do you say that I am? And as you begin to feel the force of that question on your heart, in that moment, you cannot depend on your parents' answer to that question. You can't depend on your spouse's answer to that question. You can't depend on your church's answer, on your pastor's answer, on your upbringing's answer to that question. In that moment, you have to decide for yourself, who do you say that Jesus is? And of course, you can say, 
I think you're a wonderful religious teacher. Now would you please let me get back to living my life however I want to live it? Or you can say, no, I really believe you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. You are the savior of the world, the one who can save and meet my deepest needs in my heart. And I want to follow you. And what's amazing is that that is Peter's response in this story. Verse 16, Peter speaks on behalf of the disciples. Verse 16, Peter answers Jesus' question. He says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Messiah means you are the long-awaited king. You're the one that our ancestors have been waiting for for centuries. You're the one who is going to bring justice and peace. You're going to drive out evil. You're going to conquer our enemies. You're going to establish your kingdom for good in this world. You are the Messiah. And Jesus, for his part, looks at Peter and he says, Peter, blessed are you. This has been revealed to you by my Father in heaven. And he tells Peter that he's going to be an instrumental part of how Jesus is going to establish his church in this world. He affirms Peter's answer to this question. But then he does something really strange. Very odd, very unexpected. Verse 20, here's what Jesus does. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Peter's just found the key that unlocks the meaning of life and the meaning of this world. And Jesus says, don't tell anyone that I am the Messiah. Now, why? Why wouldn't Jesus want them to go out and to begin sharing this news that he's the Messiah? I think the answer is because Jesus knows that you haven't really fully answered the first question, who is Jesus, until you've also begun to answer the second question. What has he come to do? And what difference is that gonna make in our lives? Jesus says, I don't want you going out telling people who I am until you understand what I've come to do. And in the exchange that follows that Jesus has with the disciples and with Peter, he makes it really clear that that the disciples, they don't yet grasp, they don't yet understand what Jesus has come to do and therefore don't really understand yet who he really is. So Jesus, in verse 21, begins to explain to his disciples that though he is the Messiah, he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. Jesus says, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be brutally killed. And you see, Peter and the other disciples, this doesn't make any sense to them. This does not fit their category of what a Savior, what a Messiah is supposed to be. You know, I was trying to think of an analogy, and and apparently there's a big football game later today, and I was just thinking if if they're like in overtime and the game is tied and, and Patrick Mahomes like huddles up his team, And he looks at them and he says, all right, guys, this is what we've practiced for. This is what we've trained for. This is the the big moment. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to turn the ball over. Throw an interception, fumble, run back into our own end zone. Doesn't really matter how we do it, but we're going to allow the other team to win. We're going to lose. So hands in, one, two, three, lose. I mean, just the, the shock that his teammates would feel in that moment. That's just a game writing on it, right? But the shock that Peter and his disciples would feel to hear Jesus say, this is the plan, this is what's supposed to happen, I'm gonna suffer and I'm going to die, they would say, no, that's not the plan. You're not supposed to lose, you're supposed to win. You're not supposed to be killed, you're supposed to conquer and triumph, not to suffer. And so you know what Peter does is he takes Jesus aside and we're told that he began to rebuke Jesus. Never, Lord, verse 22, he said, this shall never happen to you. This is not the plan. It's not the plan for you to suffer. And you know, Jesus, in his response to Peter, seems to kind of, kind of elevate the temperature 
of this exchange. You know, you don't expect this. I think you expect maybe Jesus to sort of take Peter aside and, and say calmly, you know, Peter, maybe you're a little bit confused. Maybe you need a little bit of help understanding what's going on here. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus often is very gentle with people, especially people on the margins, people who've really been uh, hurt or wounded. He's very gentle. He's a little stricter. He's a little harsher when he speaks to the Pharisees, to the religious leaders. But nowhere in the Gospels is Jesus harsher or more direct than he is in this exchange with Peter. Here Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. I've been in some arguments before. I've never tried that one in an argument. <laughs> If you're arguing with your spouse in the kitchen later today, I wouldn't suggest going there. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And not only does Jesus like really call Peter onto the carpet here, but he does it publicly. He doesn't take him aside as we might think would be kind of a good, uh, you know, caring, compassionate practice. He does it in front of the disciples. Verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, they're all there to hear and see this, which means that Jesus must think, though he is very compassionate, he must think that this error this way of understanding who he is and what he's come to do in their lives must be so pernicious, such a, a deadly error in the way that they think about him that it needs to be so publicly called out in this way. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, meaning you sound a lot like Satan did. Remember when Jesus was in the wilderness, at the beginning of his public ministry, he was tempted by Satan. And what did Satan say to him? He said, Jesus, you could have the kingdom, but you don't need to go through the cross. You don't need to suffer. You don't need to die. You can have the world. You can have success and achievement and greatness and glory without having to go through the path of suffering. Jesus says, you do not have in mind the things of God then. If that's your understanding, that's not the things of God. That's the way that people look at the world. Not the way that God looks at the world. Not even the way that God looks at suffering. So he challenges Peter here. He says, Peter, what do you think that I've really come to do? I think that's a question that Jesus would pose to us too. What do you think I've come to do? What, what do you expect for it to look like if you're going to follow me? You know, we, we live in America. I think this is particularly convicting. It's convicting for me to think about. We live in a culture that says that what life is all about is success and achievement and, and, and feeling good. And, and so, therefore, the idea of, of suffering for, for many of us, it feels like a, a really uninvited guest. It feels like a, just a, a disruption, an interruption to our lives. And certainly there are some churches, some churches that would teach that if you, if you follow Jesus, it's going to lead you into a life of health and wealth and prosperity. And, and maybe we would say, I don't, I don't believe that's true, but maybe we do have some notion of, of Jesus died and suffered so that I don't really have to. Jesus faced really difficult, hard things so that really bad things won't happen in my life. Maybe we have some sense that when suffering comes, it's, it's not part of the plan. It's not part of the way that God leads us into life. It's an uninvited guest. It's an unwanted disruption or interruption in God's otherwise good purposes for us. But you see, Jesus knows, he knows there's no way for him to get to the crown without going through the cross. No way for him to enter into his life and glory without going through suffering. And Jesus says, look, it's going to be the same for those who would follow me. It's going to be the same for my disciples. This is verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple 
must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And they would have known what it meant to take up a cross. That meant only one thing. You were on your way to death. Jesus says what it means to to follow me is a willingness to, to die to yourself. A willingness to deny yourself that you're following a crucified Messiah. And so as you follow me, you're going to walk through suffering as well. And, and I wonder for us this morning, it wasn't part of Peter and the disciples' category. I wonder for us this morning, is it part of our categories and the way we think about God and what he's doing in our lives? Do we have room for suffering? Do we have room for humility? Do we have room for weakness? Do we have room in the way we think about God and what he's doing in our lives to believe that, that his suffering that, that, that comes into our lives that, that is brought on by ourselves, the suffering that comes that wasn't brought on by us, the suffering that comes precisely because we're seeking to follow Jesus? Do we have room to believe it's not just an interruption? It's not just an unwanted guest in our lives, but it actually might be part of the plan. Might be part of the way that God is at work in our lives, that he's drawing us closer to himself, that he's freeing us from the idols that we worship, that he's teaching us empathy and compassion for the pain of others. Do we have room to believe part of the way God is at work in our life might be through suffering. Because Jesus says, look, I'm a crucified Messiah. I'm going to the cross. I'm going to suffer and die. And you too, if you follow me, will need to take up your cross. And yet, in so doing, as we are willing to look at our suffering through the lens of Jesus' cross, to believe that God may be working in our lives through it, Jesus actually says we can find ourselves. And that's the third question that is brought up, and he does ask it more explicitly in this passage. How can you find yourself? Look at verses 25 and 26. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? You know that word soul? The Greek word is psyche. It's the word from which we get psychology. It's a word that means your inner self, your inner life, your true self, who you really are. And you see, Jesus says, I'm the one who can help you find your true self. It's a very modern statement. It's a very modern sounding question, isn't it? How do you find yourself? Our culture's obsessed with that today, right? We, we want to discover who we really are, or we want to recreate who we are. We want to create ourselves, or we want to become a better version of ourselves. We live in a culture that's very concerned with this search for self. And Jesus says, I can help you find yourself. I can help you find your true self. I can give you like a real identity, one that is deeply rooted, one that is life-giving, one that your circumstances and the opinions of other people around you cannot take from you. I can give you your true self. But then counterintuitively, Jesus says the way that you're going to find your true self is by dying to yourself. It's by learning to deny yourself for my sake. Jesus says the way to find yourself is not actually by just chasing after your own self-seeking desires, which sometimes, frankly, are inconsistent. Sometimes they conflict. I want to eat a cheeseburger, but I also want to be healthy. Which one do I really want? We don't know sometimes. Jesus says the way you're going to find yourself, though, it's not by chasing your own desires. It's actually by learning to die to yourself, to deny yourself for my sake. To follow me out of your obedience to me, in your commitment to me. As you learn to lose yourself, he says you will find more of yourself. You'll find real life. You'll find your true identity. And I don't know, by the way, what that looks like. 
for you right now. I don't know what that looks like for every one of us in this room living in 21st century Lake Highlands. I know for some of Jesus' first century disciples, it meant literally losing their lives. Some of them literally took up a cross to follow Jesus, and yet they were comforted by these words because they were reminded this is not a sign, this suffering is not a sign of God's curse, actually his blessing. It's a way for me to know that I have identified and am walking with the man of sorrows, Jesus who suffered and died for me. For those of us here today, it might look rather different. I don't know exactly what it will look like, but I know that I've seen what it can look like. I, I know of, of men and women in this church who, who struggle with chronic pain. And yet instead of giving in to discouragement and despair, they continue to find their joy in Jesus. I, I know of, 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 of those in this church who are in really difficult conflicts, family situations where they've been hurt, they've been wronged, and yet they choose to forgive They choose not to pursue revenge because they know the way that God has forgiven them in Jesus. They're choosing to forgive. I know of those in this church who are in difficult seasons of marriage who instead of just saying, you know what, this is hard, I'm gonna hit the eject button and leave. They continue to love and to serve because they believe that Jesus has called them to that. I know of single people who choose to follow Jesus in chastity because they want to remain true to Jesus. I know of those who have lost their job or been passed over for promotions, and instead of that just crumbling their sense of identity, they know that they are still beloved sons or daughters of the king, and they're choosing to find their identity in that. I know of those who live beneath their means because they want to give away a lot of money to kingdom causes. It can look like a lot of different things. I know of a high school student who sometimes faces loneliness or exclusion because he identifies with Jesus. It can look like a lot of different things, but I'll tell you the common denominator there is a willingness to say, Jesus, I will go where you send. I will do what you say. I will obey what you command because I believe that in actually dying to myself for your sake, I will find myself. And I'll find life, the abundant life that you have promised to bring. Can I tell you, friends, Jesus doesn't give commands to ruin your life. When he says deny yourself, die to yourself to follow me, he's not out to ruin your life, but to bring you into greater life. He knows, though, that the path often to the good and beautiful life that he's come to bring often does come through suffering, just as it did for him. And so if you're a Christian here this morning, let me me reassure you that when Jesus says, he says, what can, what can you give in exchange for your soul? Let me remind you and reassure you, Jesus gave his life in exchange for your soul. That's how much he loves you. That's how committed he is to you. He gave his very life for you. He took hell into his heart, out of his love for you. So whatever you're suffering with right now, and everybody in this room is facing some kind of suffering, know that it's not because God has abandoned you. It's not because he doesn't love you. It's not because you're paying for some sin in your life. And yet, would you believe that that suffering may be a means through which Jesus is leading you actually into greater life? That as it was for Jesus, he says, you follow a crucified Messiah. Jesus went through crucifixion to the resurrection that so too he might be leading you. And if you're here this morning, And you haven't answered the first question yet. You say, I don't know if Jesus is who he says he is. I haven't answered that question yet, but frankly, all this talk of self-denial and dying to myself, I don't know if I would really want to follow Jesus. If your understanding of what it might mean to follow Jesus is that he'll bring me into a comfortable and pain-free life, can I just tell you he won't? He won't but he'll give you something far better. He will give you himself 
And he will lead you into true and abundant life and he will help you to discover who you truly are as you follow him. Jesus says, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will truly find it. So let's pray as we come to the Lord's table together this morning. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you do not ask us to give to you anything that you were not willing to first give for us and far, far, far more. We thank you for this table that reminds us of the fact that you were willing to give your life in exchange for our souls. That you loved us so much that you were willing to have your body be broken for your blood to be shed, to be cut off from the presence of your Father so that we could draw near. Jesus, I pray that this morning as we are reminded of your love for us at this table, that we would hear you asking us once again, who do you say I am? That we would respond by saying you are the Christ. You are our savior. You are the one who can meet the deepest needs of our hearts. I pray, Jesus, that we would trust that when you lead us into suffering, just as you entered into that suffering for us, that we would know that it is not random, it is not by accident, that there is some good, there is some life that you want to lead us into through that suffering. whatever that place of our lives might be, where we've been withholding our obedience to you, Jesus, we pray that you would help us in view of your grace to deny ourselves, to die to ourselves in order to follow you. And as we do, would we find greater 